the Prime Minister of New Zealand is proposing to make assault rifles illegal, which is silly on a number of levels. First of all, the definition of assault rifle, because again, an assault rifle is a made-up idea, because there's literally no such thing as a rifle that is not an assault rifle if it's used to assault somebody. If I use my bare fist to punch somebody, that is an assault fist. And so it's just a, a crazy arbitrary term that the left puts out there because it sounds scary. There's no such thing as an actual assault rifle. And so the distinction there makes no sense. And because there is no real actual distinction in the functionality of the gun between a quote-unquote assault rifle and a different kind of rifle, which again, there is no distinction there, but because there isn't, they kind of have to make up a phony definition to justify banning these particular weapons. And so in this particular case, what they have done is they have said it's a military-style semi-automatic rifle, which in other words pretty much just means black scary guns. Because if a gun is black, it has sort of that uh, dark matte finish, then you could presumably say that it's military style. I have a 12-gauge shotgun that is black, and it looks quote-unquote military style, but it's it fires 12-gauge shotgun shells. It's no different than the one that, I, that has you know, wood on it, the one that has camo. I mean, for goodness sake, you could put pink camo on it. It wouldn't change how the gun fires. But generally speaking, this is the way these laws go. This is the way they've gone in America before. It's the way they've gone in other countries. Whenever a country bans quote-unquote assault rifles, what they really mean by that is we're going to ban scary-looking guns. Usually in this legislation, I don't know if it's specific to this legislation because those details weren't made available to the public at that time, but uh, usually these include things like telescopic uh, stocks, things like a, having a scope on it, things like, for example, um, a barrel shroud. All of these things, these parts that go on guns that are largely cosmetic and don't actually change the functionality of the gun. It doesn't make the gun more lethal. It doesn't make it fire faster. It does, None of that. And so this is primarily just a scary looking gun ban just like the assault weapons bans in America and other countries have been when they try to ban assault weapons, that what they're really doing is just banning guns that they think look scary. And another thing that is included in this ban is a magazine ban. There wasn't a specific on the particular uh, number of, of rounds that can be held by a magazine. All it said was large capacity. Well, what is large capacity? Because back in the day, large capacity could be you know, seven, eight. And there are even uh, Democrats that suggested no more than five, which is a roundabout way of getting rid of all handguns. I mean, even a revolver would technically not qualify for that because most revolvers have six shots in them. And so there's a, a real absurdity, and it's so vague and inspecific that you have no way of knowing whether or not this is quote-unquote a large capacity magazine. You just don't know because large capacity, large is a relative term. And it's in the eye of the beholder. Some people might think a large magazine would be anything that holds more than 5 or more than 10 or more than 30. You just don't know. And so uh, if we ever do get some specifics on that, I'll try to bring that to your attention. But right now, it looks like it's a lot of the boneheaded uh, legislation that is proposed right here in the United States, where it's typically written and proposed and passed by people that know absolutely nothing about guns and will do nothing to curb gun violence or gun crime whatsoever. And sadly, that just seems to be par for the course when it comes to anti-gun legislation. There's also going to be a buyback program. In other words, a mandatory confiscation. And I was looking through the uh, article earlier and they had some interviews with different law enforcement officials. So essentially what happens is you have until a certain amount of time and it's not very long at all. In fact, I think it was just a week from today that if your gun is now no longer a legal firearm, even though you purchased it legally at the time, there is no grandfathering in. You can go from being a legal gun owner to somebody that is in violation of the law by doing literally nothing. If you just happen to own one of the guns that are now banned, 
If you happen to be in possession of one of those guns, even though you bought it legally, you purchased it legally, and now all of a sudden you become, uh, you are now in violation of the law just for owning something that you purchased legally. And that is the way, unfortunately, that it's going. So uh, they're doing a buyback, which means they're going to buy your guns back for you, hopefully at market value. They didn't really say but the buyback program is not like the ones that we have here in Montgomery or in other cities in America, because even though they're largely pointless here, because you don't typically get guns that would have wound up in the hands of criminals, when you do buyback programs here, it's just whoever wants to show up and turn in a gun and get money for it can. That's not the way that it's going to work in New Zealand. Specifically, this particular buyback program is going to be mandatory. Because, like I said, you're not going to be grandfathered in. So if you have one of these guns that is now classified as illegal, you have to show up to one of these buyback programs and surrender your legally purchased guns into the hands of law enforcement. So there's nothing voluntary about this. They try to say buyback because it sounds like the ones in America. It sounds like the ones that are voluntary. Nope, not this one. And if you are in violation of the law, presumably after this date has has transpired, then law enforcement could show up and treat you like a criminal just for having something that you purchased legally. So let's actually get into the merits of such a policy. First of all, there's no evidence whatsoever that enacting such laws would have made a difference because if you're looking at violent gun crimes and mass shootings in America, it actually declined after the assault weapons ban. So let's go ahead and look at that chart right now. So what you're seeing there is uh, the rate of fire homicide deaths. And remember that this particular law, the assault weapons ban, it was signed into law under President Clinton, went into effect in 1994, and it expired in 2004. So there were 10 years worth where, quote-unquote, assault weapons were banned. Now look at the rate of firearm deaths. And these are homicides, specifically. So... If you look, 1993 is that number that you're seeing at the top, a 7 per 100,000 people. And you're going to see this drop, but you'll notice that it stayed pretty stagnant before then, and it was trending downward anyway. And you'll notice that after it expires in 2004, it does about the same. Even though we have drastically increased our gun ownership. So if more guns equal more crimes with guns, then this chart completely debunks that. That's sort of the thinking is that once you ban these quote-unquote dangerous military-style weapons is that you're going to see a decrease in firearm homicide deaths. The data just doesn't bear that out because it seemingly had no effect whatsoever on homicide deaths here in the United States. It's stagnant beforehand, you do see a drop there at some point, but you don't see that, that trend continue if you presumably thought that homicides were going to increase after that policy expired. It just doesn't. So the assault weapons ban has shown, at least in America, that it had no effect on that. And by the way, that chart is a little bit old. It only went to 2010. But if you bring it on further, it winds up declining to about, I believe, 3.2 in 2017, 2018. So we're still on a downward trend, even though we continue to increase the number of guns per person. And America has way more guns than any other country per per person. We actually have more guns than people, just barely more, but more. Uh, I believe for 100,000, it's something about, we have about 101 So it's just barely that we have more guns than we have people, but you're thinking about that in a nation of 320 million people, and these are just the guns that we know about. This isn't counting all the guns that are out there that either aren't registered or whatever else. So the best estimate is it's slightly more than 320 million. Um, I would guess that it's actually a little bit higher, just because I know a lot of people that have guns that there'd be no way for you to trace them. And so I'm guessing that it's probably closer to about 350 million, maybe 400 million. 
Uh, that's just a, a rough guess. I don't have anything to back that up, and, and neither does anyone else. But at the very least, we have as many guns as we have people in the United States. And that trend has actually been on the increase. We have more guns now than we ever have in our history. And our guns have actually increased more than our population at a higher rate in the past couple of decades. And yet, gun crime continues to fall. And the gun homicide rate was completely unaffected by our assault weapons ban. And so that really does just go to show you that there's no truth whatsoever to this myth that an assault weapons ban has any effect whatsoever on crimes committed with guns. In fact, we're talking about a assault weapons ban and an assault rifles ban. Well, the vast majority of crimes are actually committed with handguns. And there's really seemingly no correlation, even mass shootings. The weapon of choice are handguns. And so when you're looking at this, the idea that the assault weapons ban, specifically an assault rifles ban, is going to have any effect on these crimes, there's really just nothing in the data that bears that out. And you have to keep this in mind, too. Even though this is a horrible tragedy and we do need to treat it with a, a certain level of you know, caution and sensitivity. Let's remember that this happened in New Zealand, a place that already has far stricter gun control than America does. And sort of to, uh, if you're looking at a comparison of gun ownership between countries, New Zealand is 21st. 21st. So they're nowhere near the top. And you're looking at that, and you're talking about first world countries as well. So if you're looking at them, they're 21st in the world on gun ownership per person. There's about 23 guns per 100 people. Like I already said, America has roughly 101 guns. So we've got about three times per capita the amount of guns that they do. And if you're looking at uh, countries that are ahead of them, Switzerland, Finland, Iceland, Australia, Canada, Norway, France, all have more guns per capita than them. All of them. And these are countries with very strict limits on guns. And so the idea that this new restriction coming out is going to somehow limit the chances of another mass shooting in New Zealand or gun homicides in New Zealand, there's really no reason to believe that because New Zealand already has pretty restrictive gun control laws and ranks pretty low compared to other first world nations even nations like Canada and France that are thought of as having very strict gun control. Canada less so than France, but definitely France, definitely uh, Finland, very restrictive on gun ownership. New Zealand still ranks below them in terms of guns owned per capita. And so the idea that this is going to have really any effect whatsoever on that is patently absurd. Let's go ahead and uh, look at this graphic here. This is comparing annual death rates uh, from mass public shootings by country. And this is the frequency of mass public sh shootings. Now, I want you to notice that on this chart, America for annual death rate is 11th. Now, if you look at frequency of mass shootings, we're 12th. Behind several of those nations that I just mentioned... And I want you to notice, this isn't every country in the world. This is just European countries. And that's important because a lot of people that will look at charts that show mass shooting deaths and that kind of thing, some of the countries that usually rank very high on that are countries like Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, you know, Middle Eastern countries, and really poor countries, for example, in South America. No, no, this is just European countries and then the U.S. and Canada. That's it. And yet, if you're looking at the frequency, so the, these are countries that keep records when it comes to law enforcement. These are countries that have a lot more restrictive gun control laws than America. And America owns way more guns than any of these countries per capita. And you're looking at the death rate of mass shootings. So in other words, how many people die per mass shooting and also the frequency of mass shootings. America doesn't even crack the top 10. So this idea that more guns equals more mass shootings or more mass shooting fatalities simply is not true. The data does not bear that out. So uh, let's also look at the deadliest mass shootings on Earth. 
So if you were to look at this, these are the 10 deadliest mass shootings in the world that we have on record. Now, you'll look up at the top. You've got Kenya, Pakistan. These are including this one, unlike the other chart, does include some third world countries as well. But then in third place, Paris, France. You remember the Paris, France shooting that took 130 people? That's on there as well. France, another country with very tight restrictions on guns. Also Norway again. So you have to get to number six before you even get to America. We don't even rank in the top five in the deadliest mass shootings. And then you don't see us again until, unfortunately, Orlando, California in eighth, which sadly, now that the shooting in Christchurch, New Zealand has occurred, uh, we're tied with them for eighth place on that. So, Again, the idea that an increase in gun ownership or having more guns out there leads to more mass shootings and a lack of gun control is the reason for that is patently false. Because there are nations with way stricter gun control than America that are neck and neck or even ahead of America when you're looking at these statistics. So uh, the guns really are not the problem. The guns aren't the problem. The people are the problem. And it's terrible that... I I do wish that... I mean, if I had a a magic button to press and then that got rid of all the problems that we had with guns and violence in the world, believe me, I'd press it. But that's just simply not the way the world works. Banning guns and restricting the liberties of law-abiding citizens does absolutely nothing to keep your country safe from these tragedies. And by any honest look at the numbers, the statistics bear out that simple truth. And the thing is, even even if the data didn't bear that out, even if the data didn't show that, even if America did have more mass shootings or whatever, it's still a bad idea to make decisions of such a sweeping nature that affect so many law-abiding citizens by looking at mass shootings. And the reason for that is mass shootings, regardless of what country you're talking about, are so incredibly rare when you're looking compared to the amount of gun homicides that they make up, when you're looking at the amount of gun deaths. They are such a tiny, minuscule amount of gun crimes and gun crime fatalities that making a policy based solely on them makes absolutely no sense. You're setting a policy and setting a general rule for something that is so incredibly rare. Uh, I think the statistic that we did uh, back when the Parkland shooting was still fresh in our minds was that in the United States, you are, it was something like 10 times more likely to be struck by lightning seven times. That's how ridiculously high the factor was than you were to be killed in a school shooting. Not saying that there aren't people that died in school shootings because there certainly were. But the point is, these events are so insanely rare that making huge sweeping policy changes that affects millions of people based on a knee-jerk reaction to one particular event makes absolutely no sense. In New Zealand, for example, one of the things that they're pointing out is, well, it's been 20 years since New Zealand had a mass shooting. Yeah, which would suggest that having no assault weapons ban was not really a big problem. Wasn't exactly causing a whole bunch of mass shootings. Same thing with Australia. They talked about how up until, I think, last year when they had that mass shooting of nine people, um, they said that, well, Australia got rid of their guns and didn't have any mass shootings for a long time. Yeah, but they also didn't have a lot of mass shootings before that either. And so that's the point that we're having. These events are so insanely rare. They are so far outside the normal parameters of what you would normally look to to figure out is something a good policy or not. It is such a tiny, tiny sample size that making decisions based on those events really does not make any sense. Oh, hey, what are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell, 
And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs>